This episode was suggested by a listener, Wesley, on Facebook. If you'd like to suggest a topic or just say hi, you can do so on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast, on Twitter at Morbid Podcast, or on our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com. I'd like to apologize in advance for my pronunciation of Icelandic words and names. I'm not a native speaker, and although I used a guide, I'm sure I won't get it quite right. My apologies. Also, as a non-Icelander, I tried my best to represent what I read by native Icelandic authors about this topic. If you have any issues or comments, please feel free to email me at morbidcuriositypodcast at gmail.com. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. In 2013, much of the world was caught up in a certain news story involving Icelandic roadworks, which circulated in the international media and especially online. People were protesting the building of a bridge from the Alftenes Peninsula to a suburb of the capital city of Iceland, Reykjavik. This itself wasn't what caught the media's attention. It was the fact that the protesters' reasons for halting construction were not only because the road would destroy a habitat for animals, but would also have a detrimental impact on the elves that lived there. The media caught the word elf and held it under a microscope. When most people from Western countries hear elves, they think either of Santa's workshop or, if they're fantasy geeks, Lord of the Rings. The idea that modern people could believe in what are considered fantasy creatures raised many eyebrows. Journalists flocked to Iceland to ask about these elves, both amused and curious if the people of Iceland really believed in these fantasy creatures. The story grew when it was revealed a woman proclaiming to be a seer and clairvoyant was trying to negotiate with the elves in order to get construction going again. As the non-native journalists peered deeper into the story, they found that this was not the first instance of a construction project being changed or halted due to the presence of elves in Iceland. Another well-known incident occurred, involving a huge rock formation called Alfhol, which means Elf Hill. Roadwork was attempted near the rock from the 1930s to the 1980s, and throughout that time was halted over and over again. Machines broke down, tools were damaged or disappeared, and finally the workers refused to go near the rock formation, worried they had offended the elves that were said to live there. Eventually, Alfol gained protection from the nearby city as a cultural heritage site, and the road was rerouted around it. After this press storm, tourism began to pick up in Iceland, with elves being a large draw. Maps of the most popular elf locations and tours of elf hotspots appeared, road signs claiming that elves could be seen at the next exit, and prices to see such things went up. The Alfaskolen, an elf school, opened in 1991 in Reykjavik and still teaches about Icelandic folklore and the 13 different kinds of elves that the school believes inhabits the island. They offer educational excursions to tourists and visitors, as well as aura readings and past life explorations. Despite this recent media and tourist fervor, tales of the elves, more locally known as huldefolk, meaning hidden people, are not new to Iceland. In fact, they are very ancient. It is not known when they appeared in the oral stories passed down from generation to generation, but the first written mention of the elves, or alfar, appeared in a collection of Old Norse literature referred to as the Prose Edda. The Prose Edda was written, or perhaps collected, by famous Icelandic politician, poet, and historian Snorri Sturluson around the year 1220 CE. 
This collection features references to the hidden people, or possibly their folkloric precursor. The Prose Edda relates much of what is known about Norse mythology, including descriptions of the nine parallel worlds that are all supported by the great world tree, Yggdrasil. It also tells of the Aesir, the principal Norse pantheon of gods, such as Odin, Thor, and Loki, who are still well-known characters all over the Western world thanks to the Marvel franchise. The Aesir are often mentioned in tandem with the Alfar, suggesting that the two are quite similar. In fact, ancient skalds, or performers of poetry, used the word Alfar much in the same way as the word God. According to the Prose Edda, three of the nine realms are home to elf-like beings. The Light Elves, or Eosalfar, live in Alfheim, just below the world of the gods, Asgard. The Dark Elves, or Dokalfar, live deep in the earth and have skin as black as pitch. They may be dwarves under another name, another creature of mythology known to live under mountains. A third type of elf is also mentioned, the Svartalfar, or Black Elves, who live in Svartalfheim, a place of crafting. These elves may also be synonymous with the Dark Elves and Dwarves, the Edda is not very clear. Around 1270, an unnamed collection of Old Norse poems, now referred to as the Poetic Edda, was written within an Icelandic medieval manuscript, called the Codex Regius. One of the only characters in this Edda explicitly identified as an elf is Volundr, the protagonist in the Volundarkvida, or the Lay of Voland, lay in this case meaning poem. Fun fact, as a professor of Old Norse, J.R.R. Tolkien was very familiar with both the Eddas and drew much inspiration from them in his writings, especially in The Hobbit. He also translated several Old Norse stories, such as the Saga of the Volsungs, he also translated some Old English stories, such as Beowulf. With the introduction of Christianity, the tales about the Huldefolk changed. Instead of godlike creatures, they became children of Adam and Eve, and were made invisible to the eyes of humans, because Eve, who had not finished bathing all her children, hid the dirty ones from God when he came to visit. He knew she had hidden them, and punished her by making those children hidden forever. Other Christianized versions of the origin of the Hidden People suggest the Hidden People were descended from Lilith, a female demonic figure in Jewish mythology. Still another version says they were fallen angels, or angels that did not side with either Lucifer or God, and therefore condemned to exist between heaven and hell. Either way, the Hidden People must have been well established by this point, otherwise the priesthood would not have bothered to adapt and change the stories about them. In the 1600s, Icelanders began documenting their own folklore. Einar Olivar Svensson, an Icelandic scholar of Old Norse literature, stated that around this time, the sources that refer to the Huldefolk grew substantially and made it easy for scholars to define the beliefs and legends about them. This is thought to be due to the hard times that befell Iceland around this time, and the tales survived as a source of hope and identity for the Icelanders who shared them. During this time, it appears that everyone knew someone who knew someone who had seen one of the Huldefolk. The Huldefolk were said to appear very similar to humans, but were much more beautiful. They wore colorful clothing and lived in beautiful little houses in the rocks and hillocks away from urban areas. They had livestock, which was fat and healthy, and worked in the fields just like humans did. They were also mischievous, hiding things from humans, or trying to scare them by making noises around them. They were also known to throw raging parties on holidays and invite humans to join, which always resulted in severe consequences for the humans. The Huldefolk were invisible, but could be seen if they wished by a privileged few. Human children were thought to be able to see them until they were baptized, and were often at risk of being stolen by the Huldefolk and replaced by an elderly elf. If you want to know more about this specific bit of folklore, you can listen to our episode on changelings. The most important thing about the Huldefolk in these later stories was that it was best not to offend them, as bad luck would certainly follow. They could make the offender sick, cause their cows to stop producing milk, and cause setbacks to any projects around their farms. The most common tales of Huldefolk involved a human working in the fields, usually alone, 
who saw some of the hidden people, but didn't know it until the person disappeared in the blink of an eye. Also common were humans who wandered off and were then taken in by the kind Hulda folk, never to return. Humans often found themselves in trouble and were helped by mysterious people who then vanished. Just as common as these tales are several darker ones, in which humans tried to move or impose on the homes of the Hilda folk and were cursed by them. Many times a human fell in love with an elf or was sexually assaulted by one and became pregnant or ran off with them never to return. These elves were called Ijuflingar and were most often a danger to human women. Most encounters with the Hulda folk happen when a human is alone and somewhere far from other people. Many times the sun has set. Sometimes the Hulda folk visit in dreams, asking for help. Sometimes they send visions, like dancing lights across a field, or the sound of bells or footsteps. Here are a few specific tales that I found in a very informative book called The Little Book of the Hidden People by Alda Sigmundsdottir, who has also written several books on Iceland and its history. It gave excellent background for the reason these stories are still important to the people of Iceland, and why they are more than just stories, but also a reflection of the times in which they were recorded. I highly recommend it. One of the most repeated tales I found in my research was that of a man who became lost. An old elf woman found him and invited her back to her well-kept house and introduced him to her two beautiful daughters. He asked if he might spend the night with one of them, and she agreed. That night, when he tried to embrace the young woman, his hands passed right through her. She smiled and told him she was a spirit and that no human would ever touch her. Another story tells of a man who rejected the advances of an elf woman. The first time, he only walked away from her. When she persisted a second time, instead of walking away, he shoved her and shamed her. She remarked that even if he didn't want to do her bidding, he did not have to degrade her so. She added that he would get his just rewards later, as would all his offspring. After the man married, he soon began having seizures. His daughter could not rise from her bed and could not speak and died young. After her death, her sister went insane without any previous history of mental illness. The last story I'll share goes like this. A young boy was tending his sheep near a cliffside when he heard a loud noise. Looking over the cliff, he spotted a small sheep trapped on a ledge just below the edge of the cliff. The young boy carefully climbed down to the sheep, but was unable to climb back up with the sheep in hand. Suddenly, a face peered over the edge and offered to help the boy. The boy accepted and was lifted back up the cliff with his sheep. When he had recovered, he turned to thank his rescuer, but they had disappeared. This last story is the type that is most often told, where a human is given aid or sees someone in the distance that disappears in the blink of an eye. In the 19th century, Huldefolk was taken as a synonym for Alfar, or elf. According to Jan Arnason, an Icelandic writer who put together the first detailed collection of Icelandic folklore, this term was used either because Alfar is thought of as a derogatory term, or because it was thought to be dangerous to say their true name. It's quite possible the two terms actually referred to two distinct supernatural beings in the past. There are four annual Icelandic holidays in which a connection with the Hulda folk survived. On Christmas Eve, food is left out for the Hulda folk as they make their way to their own elf churches. They are also said to invade farmhouses and hold wild parties during Christmas, which are dangerous for humans to join. One story tells of a maidservant who joined in their parties and was beheaded and left in the doorframe of the farmhouse. On New Year's Eve, it is believed the Hulda folk move their homes to new locations, and many Icelanders leave out candles to help them find their way. On the 13th night, which occurs on January 6th and celebrates the end of the Christmas season, elf bonfires are a common part of celebrations, as well as elf dances and fireworks. On Midsummer's Night, which occurs on June 24th, folklore states that if you sit at a crossroads with a sharp axe, elves will attempt to lure you away with food and gifts. If you follow them, there are grave consequences. If you resist, there are great rewards. That same night, cows may also speak, and seals may become human. Folktales are one thing, but stopping construction of a road for a folktale is another. 
A survey was completed in 1975 by Orni Björnsson, the former director of the Ethnological Department of the National Museum of Iceland, to determine what percentage of Icelanders truly believed in elves or huldefolk. Only 10% believed they existed, while 48% thought it was possible they existed. In 2006, this survey was repeated and found that 8% believed, 16% thought it was likely, and 31% thought it was possible that the Huldefolk exist. Anthropologist Kirsten Hastrup did a similar survey, but used questions that were far less leading than do you believe in elves. Her results were very different, with few people saying they believed in elves, but even fewer denied the possibility of their existence completely. So, is any of this true? Do most Icelanders believe in the possibility of the Huldefolk? From my research, I can tell you that those like the self-proclaimed seers of elves and those who run the elf school appear to be the exception, not the rule in Iceland. In fact, it seems it annoys most Icelanders that their people and country has gained this unfair reputation. The situation is far more complicated and interesting than just belief in a fantasy creature. To explain, we have to dive deep into the physical and cultural history of Iceland. But before I tell you where these stories came from and what they represent, let's have a word from our sponsors. Our regular sponsor is Audible.com. If you're always on the go and too busy to sit down and read, you can still enjoy a good book with Audible.com. There are over 180,000 audiobooks to choose from, which you can listen to on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or other MP3 players. MCP listeners can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of Audible.com by going to www.audibletrial.com MCP. You can also find this link on our Facebook page and website. If you sign up for the free trial, you get a free audiobook that is yours to keep, even if you cancel the service and the MCP gets the funding it needs to keep bringing morbid history to your ears. Another great new sponsor is Think Geek, the premier retailer for the global geek community. Express your love of Marvel, Star Trek, Dungeons & Dragons, Legend of Zelda, and more with clever t-shirts and other unique apparel, home and office decor, electronics, collectibles, and so much more. Think Geek has great gifts whether you're into science or science fiction. And many of the items they sell you won't find anywhere else. Just follow our link, bit.ly slash morbidgeek, to search their massive selection of geeky gear. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash morbidgeek to get your geek on. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not support or sponsor the MCP yourself by way of a donation? Your gifts go directly to the research materials and other things we use to create this podcast. If you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and click the Donate button. You can even set up a monthly donation if you're feeling extra generous. Just $5 a month helps us out a lot, and it probably costs less than a large latte at your favorite coffee shop. I'd love to do this for a living, and your donations can help make that dream a reality. I really appreciate your support. And now, back to the podcast. To understand why these tales of the Huldefolk have survived into the modern era, first we have to understand the geological and social history of Iceland. The island of Iceland was not settled until 870 CE, quite late in the grand scheme of the spread of humanity across the world. The island itself is not that old, having only come into existence about 20 million years ago, thanks to volcanic activity along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a line where two tectonic plates are being pushed apart. Iceland sits right on top of this line. The Earth's crust is actually one-third its usual thickness around Iceland, and magma still continues to rise up along the ridge, pushing the plates apart. The island was first documented by ancient Greek explorer Pythaeus around 325 BCE. He called it Ultima Thule, which means a distant place beyond the known world, and was the first to describe the midnight sun, a natural phenomenon that occurs in Iceland and other locations near the Arctic or Antarctic circles, in which the sun remains visible at midnight in the summer. In the winter in these locations, polar night occurs, where the sun stays below the horizon all day. 
Pythaeus wrote that the island was rumored to be home to fierce storms, howling winds, and dog-headed people. This rumor kept explorers away for centuries. It's possible that Irish monks settled on Iceland shores around 700 CE, but the first intentional settlement, according to a 12th century document called the Islandinkapok, was founded by Ingulfur Arneson, who had fled Norway in 871 CE. The settlement he created was Reykjavik, which means Smoky Bay, and was named for the steam that hangs in the air due to thermal springs that exist there. Iceland is home not only to hot springs, but also geysers, volcanoes and volcanic fissures, fumaroles, mud pots, and other thermal occurrences. It's also home to glaciers, which have shaped the land, causing fjords, crevasses, valleys, and cliffs. Wind constantly rips across the landscape, and icebergs often float not far offshore. The Aurora Borealis, also known as the Northern Lights, can be seen eight months out of the year. Earthquakes are also common, thanks to the presence of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Many folklorists have said that living in this landscape would make anyone believe in otherworldly spirits, as the land is so unpredictable to humans. The inhabitants had to adapt to the land and its many dangers, and it's likely many ancient taboos, customs, superstitions, and tales were created and survived thanks to the unpredictability of the land. These occurrences couldn't be explained at the time, so humans created their own explanations. Not only is the landscape harsh, Iceland has been subject to much social and political upheaval over the years. Icelandic tradition holds that the settlement of Iceland picked up when people fled the tyranny of the first king of Norway, Harald Fairhair, between 870 and 932 CE. The chieftains of the many small settlements of Iceland created a parliament of their own, called the Althing. During this time, the religion practiced in Iceland was Ausatru, a name for the Old Norse religion. This rich belief system was brought over with them into an unpopulated land and therefore grew to be incredibly rooted into the intense environmental conditions of the land. Stories often formed around specific locations thanks to environmental factors associating accidents and disasters with spells and curses or supernatural beings. The Huldefolk may have started as spirits of the land, created after Iceland was settled, and these tales then mixed with the ancestral myths that the people brought with them, creating the Alfar. Those that could see them were thought to have Ovreski, a second sight, and this is documented in both early and later accounts of the Alfar. Around the year 1000, the whole country was forced to convert to Christianity due to pressure from the Norwegian king. This was done peacefully, although the pagan religion was still practiced in private all over the island. The new faith mixed with the old faith, sometimes purposefully, and the Huldefolk changed again. Most elf worship ended at this time, but the offerings left out for the elves on New Year's Eve continued, and it was then said that those who could see the Huldefolk had not been properly baptized. Through this conversion, Iceland remained largely independent, and between the 1100s and the 1230s, Iceland went through a golden age, when most of the Norse sagas were collected and written down by historians, such as Snorri Sturluson. By the end of the 13th century, however, internal conflict caused anarchy on the island, weakening it for outside invaders. In 1281, Iceland was absorbed by Norway. Norway then united with Sweden and Denmark, but when this union fell apart, Iceland remained under Danish control. The strict Danish trade monopoly over Iceland ruined the economy in the 17th and 18th centuries. The financial troubles were aggravated by several severe natural disasters, such as the Black Death in 1402 and a massive volcanic eruption in 1783, which caused a poisonous gas cloud to kill 25% of the human population and 50% of the livestock on the island. After World War I, the Althing was restored, and Iceland regained its sovereignty. However, it remained under the Danish monarchy until the start of World War II. Though Iceland was neutral in the war, it was peacefully occupied by the Allies to prevent the Nazis from invading. 
In 1944, after the war was over, Iceland declared its complete independence from Denmark, which was still under Nazi occupation, and then became a founding member of the United Nations. Understandably, in the mid-19th century, the tales of the Huldefolk became significant again as the nation felt pride in its heritage and people began collecting oral narratives and writing them down. This was occurring all over Europe, with the Brothers Grimm being a large part of it. Jan Arnesen and Magnus Grimson were Iceland's main collectors. Iceland went through rapid modernization after World War II. In the mid-1900s, many people still lived without electricity or modern plumbing. This jump brought the ancient and modern together, which may be another reason for the lasting beliefs or the openness to the possibility of these beliefs in the modern era. Alda Sigmundsdottir states that many Icelanders feel that the tourist and media fixation with elves is a parody of something quite profound. The ancient lore reflects the plight of a nation living in abject poverty on the edge of an inhospitable world and the heroic efforts of its people to survive both physically and emotionally. When these stories were most popular, life in Iceland revolved around the most basic needs such as food, shelter, and warmth, none of which was easy to come by. People lived in turf houses, which were damp, full of insects, and not well ventilated. Outside these homes, the people were at the mercy of their environment, which was unpredictable and harsh. Children had a 50% chance of surviving to adulthood. These tales were a primary method of educating and entertaining in the darker times faced by Icelanders. They gave clear social messages concerning human behavior, focusing on respecting nature and other beings. They held a very meaningful role in raising children, advising against climbing on large rocks and hillocks. They advised children to be well-behaved, otherwise they would be mistaken for a changeling, which we know from previous episodes were beaten in order to force them to reveal themselves. These stories warned against danger, but also instilled respect for the harsh powers of nature. The nation was also oppressed for much of its history, subject to arbitrary laws imposed on them by not only their colonial rulers, but the church as well. Under these conditions, with no hope of improvement in sight, the stories of the Huldefolk helped people survive. They were an escape from misery, a look into a world that was parallel to their own, but better, more prosperous and orderly. These stories were a projection of the very dreams and desires of the Icelandic people. In the case of the Íjúflingar, the elves that loved and seduced human women, these tales reflect a deep yearning of women for the love and tenderness in ancient Iceland. The women of the 17th and 18th century lacked this tenderness in their daily lives, both because toughness was seen as a virtue and also because Icelandic women were forbidden to marry until they had reached a financial standing that was impossible for many. These laws were imposed to reduce the number of mouths that needed feeding. However, human instinct has a tendency to override legal and moral decrees, and many times, unwanted children were the outcome. Parents of these illegitimate children were punished, so the Íjúflingar were created as an explanation of an accidental or unwanted pregnancy. The fate of humans in these stories often depends on how they interact with the Huldefolk. The Huldefolk react differently when they are treated with respect, as opposed to disdain. When they came in dreams and asked for help, if humans helped them, they were rewarded. If not, something bad would happen. This is both a morality tale and reflects a yearning to have some control over their own lives. Peasants in Iceland during the 17th and 18th century were of the same social status as children. They were required by law to have a fixed place on a farm, completely subservient to their employer. They couldn't leave without permission, even to visit family. Women were not even paid. Even if someone gained a little more control by moving up in society, this could change at the drop of a hat. For women especially, if their husband died, their entire household was often dissolved, their belongings auctioned off, and their children removed to foster homes. They had absolutely no choice in the matter. 
But in these stories, if they saw and helped a hidden person, they had a tiny bit of power over their own destiny. The elf stories may have represented a vague and desperate attempt at feeling in control. The Huldefolk stories also began to merge with tales of outlaws at this time, possibly because the outlaws were freer than most of the population. They were also feared as well as revered, just like the Huldefolk. So, while most modern Icelanders don't consider themselves believers in elves, they also can't bring themselves to deny the possibility that they exist. A deep respect for heritage and the land has survived from the very beginning of human existence in Iceland, and it manifests as this open-mindedness, this refusal to deny the possibility of forces greater than themselves. That is why these tales bring out the curiosity in us. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show at Morbid Podcast or find us on Facebook and Instagram at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media and give us a rating on iTunes. Thank you to Terry, Aaron, Kevin, Miranda, Stephanie, Tez, Kenneth, Lisa, and Derek for their comments and suggestions on Facebook. Thank you to Danielle and Pam for their comments on Instagram. Thank you to Allison for sharing her thoughts on our YouTube channel. And to all of you who have subscribed so far, keep it up. Thank you to Ilona, Neskria, Lou, Emerian, The Forgotten News Podcast, and Kill Scarlet 42 for their comments and shares on Twitter. And thank you to Kevin W30 for your review on iTunes. Thanks to you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners and answer polls we occasionally put out to learn more about you. Also, the MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. If you like the show, why not support the MCP with a donation? As mentioned earlier, if you'd like to donate, you can go to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com and click that donation button. On our website, you'll also find links to our social media and other ways to contact us. We love hearing from you, and we really appreciate your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.